Okay, we have reached 5.30, and it's time for public testimony. The rules for public testimony are on the screen, and I ask that speakers be respectful of these rules, and frankly, to the rest of us in this room. I would note that the board does not take public comments on items related to personnel or individually named staff. The majority of the speaker's time must be spent on the topic he or she has indicated they wish, wish to speak about. Each speaker has a two-minute speaking time. When the two minutes have ended, please conclude your remarks. You will see a yellow light at that new beautiful podium that our staff built us. And uh, you've got 30 seconds to wrap up. Please read off the testimony speakers. Nell Baker, followed by CC Chan, followed by Anissa Roydad. Whenever I'm ready. <laughs> okay. My name is Nell Baker, and I'm a senior at Ballard High School. I'm here today to share about my consent book clubs centered around the true crime novel, Missoula, Rape and the Justice System in a College Town by John Krakauer. With the help of my school librarian, Tuesday Chambers, I started this project by reaching out to the athletic coaches and team captains in my school, encouraging them to join a conversation that is rarely talked about in the classroom. By the first meeting, 20 kids and seven staff members had checked out the book and were working hard on defining words like sexual assault, rape, and consent. This began what is the highlight of my week every week. As we read, watched TED Talks, and discussed topics ranging from victim blaming to toxic masculinity, I saw a change in my peers and teachers. I started getting messages after school from the male students in the book club asking questions about that week's discussions and wanting my input on their ideas. I listened to them explain how they had struggled trying to uphold the stereotypes of masculinity and how because of this conversation, they felt as if they can be more accepting of themselves and others. Many students who are involved are also part of Ballard's Black Student Union and Multicultural Committee, which has led to great conversations about how everyone can be an ally, whether it's against fighting racism or sexual violence. Though this book club has reached a small group of my peers, I believe this conversation should be bigger because this is an issue that many face silently and alone and unfortunately is not going away. During the week of April 22nd, 2019, Ballard High School will be having a sexual assault awareness week to encourage staff and students to join a difficult conversation in order to create a safer community. I ask and strongly encourage the Seattle School District join us in doing so, thereby creating an official district recognition week dedicated to creating safe places for conversations on topics that way too many of our students and staff members are affected by. It is imperative that the people with power and with voices help push progress and become the ally we need in our school district. Thank you. Can you, can you just repeat that date for me? Yeah, um, it's going to be the week of April 22nd through the 26th. Make sure you put SPS directors at seattleschools.org on your list as well as school board at seattleschools.org. That'll go to the board and all senior staff. Spread okay. the good word. Thank you. Can't come if we don't know when to be there. Thank you. Okay, hi guys, my name is Cece Chan. I'm a senior at Nathan Hill High School and I'm also the representative for the NAACP Youth Coalition. And I wanna talk really quickly about race. So race was created by humans and it withholds white supremacy because you put um, white people over all the people of color. And I kinda thought that Seattle schools kinda looks like it reflects this white supremacy because we grow up learning about all these European cultures in our classes, but we never learn about the students of color's cultures. And that just seemed kinda weird to me. And so when we do talk about our students of color, they're always talked about in a bad light. Like, why is it that black students only hear about slavery? And then for me, it's like, how am I supposed to learn about myself through the Chinese railroad workers? Like, that's no representation for me or my peers of color. And then also, I feel like Seattle schools is very selective in what we talk about. Like, we're very open to talk about the 9-11 
terrorism, but then we don't want to talk about the terrorism within our own country of the lynching of black people. So it's very selective. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, so, I, I don't know, it was really sad to me that I didn't even know that there was Chinese lynchings. So I feel like it's really selective in what we teach, and then it just builds these kind of biases and stereotypes of other people. Like, I feel like I'm more than just Chinese railroad workers and the dynasty. I feel like I'm an empowered Asian woman who should be able to do whatever she wants, even if my peers do make fun of my eyes and tell me that I only get good grades because I'm Asian. I feel like you guys should be helping break these biases at a young age. I feel like we grow up and then all I read are about like little white girls with blonde hair in like my books in elementary school and I remember even trying to fix my eyes. I would just encourage you guys to look into other books uh, that we could read growing up so that we don't have these biases growing up because it starts at a young age and I would encourage teacher training too because this is happening and it's really sad because we're losing our identities to all these stereotypes and biases. Yep. That's it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Anissa Roydad. I am a junior at Ballard High School and part of the NAACP Youth Coalition. Last year, Director DeWolf wrote a powerful and unapologetic resolution declaring that Black Lives Matter, which passed unanimously. The resolution expired this year, although the plights of the black community have not. Although indefinite support of this resolution is necessary, it's not enough. To turn affirmation into action, we need to support um, this year's Black Lives Matter at School Week demands. Namely, one, ending zero tolerance and implementing restorative justice. Two, mandatory black history and ethnic studies with the emphasis on mandatory. Three, hiring more black teachers. And four, funding counselors, not cops. This isn't a partisan issue. It's not isolated to one race or another. It's simply human. I'm standing here in solidarity with black students, teachers, and parents because like Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And supporting these demands will help overcome historic injustices that the black community has faced. Not only the de do these demands give black students the resources and support they need to succeed, but they lift everyone up. I implore you to think about policy 0030, about ensuring racial and educational justice. Um, it hangs on this very wall. Uh, remember why it was written. Ask yourself what has been done to uphold it and what is left. I hope you realize that supporting the Black Lives Matter at School Week demands is part of making, the, uh, <laughs> is part of accomplishing that resolution. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Rena Mateja Walker Burr, followed by Amina Adams, it's followed by Rena Caitlin Mateja. Stark. Um, so I don't really have a speech written, so I might be all over the place, but I'm just going to start. Um, basically, I feel like Seattle Public Schools is very is doing very little to back up ethnic studies, and I feel like this because you know we'll go to the school board meetings and we'll testify and we'll tell you guys how I feel. And like, well, you guys will like nod your head, but I won't see you guys in schools. You guys don't do anything to come down to come down to our schools or listen to us. You guys have one day to teach teachers on like what they should do. But I'll ask my teachers on like, oh, like what did you guys learn? And they're like, I don't really know. Like it was kind of like this way, but like I was thinking it should have been something different. And so I just basically are just. I kind of want to hold you guys accountable to make sure that you guys are doing what you guys are supposed to be doing because very little is being done. And I just want to remind you guys that ethnic studies is more than just a curriculum. It's people's life because after you learn ethnic studies, your life changes because it's no longer just words in a textbooks. It's stuff that you can take out into the real world and it's stuff that you can learn and it's stuff that people can actually 
value in their everyday life. Like, I don't really understand, like, where I will use y equals mx plus b other than if I become something else, but I know where I can apply ethnic studies and that's in my everyday life. So I just want to make sure that like, even like if you if one of you guys come down to like a school or a middle school or a high school once a month, just to make sure you know that we're doing all right. Like I, I, I don't see you guys anywhere else but here. And this is the only time I get to see you. And testimony starts at like what, 4.30? But people have homework to do, have other jobs to take care of, just to take care of their siblings. Not everybody can testify and say what I'm saying right now. Thank you. Next up is Amina Adams. Um, hi, my name is Amina Adams. I'm a senior at Rainier Beach. I'm part of NYC. Mm -hmm. And uh, today I'm going to be speaking on behalf of ethnic studies. So um, European culture has been dominating the curriculum, which supports white privilege. Other cultures are not being represented in the curriculum, which creates an illusion that European populations founded, created, just to name a few, medicine, mathematics, geography, street lights, etc., which is untrue. Have they contributed? Yes, but the curriculum that students are reading makes it seem as if anyone who identifies as white did all of the creating and exploring of America. So we need ethnic studies in our curriculum so that students can get a bigger picture that all ethnicities contributed to America because we are not being exposed enough. And I'm done. <laughs> Next up is Caitlin Start, followed by Isaiah Corver, followed by India Carlson. Hi, I'm Caitlin Start from Washington Middle School, and I want to speak on behalf of the music program, staff, and students that are in the music program. Um, so with the music program, administration has had very little communication with the music program and Friends of Washington Music, which is an organization that is self-funded to fund the music program, pretty much. And so one of the main issues with administration and the music program is very little communication in general. Like, we don't know if they're going to cut the music program in general because in the beginning of the year, fiddlists were completely cut, and we had to let go of a staff member that was um, an orchestra teacher. So I'm not 100% sure what will happen in the future with the music program, but what I do know is that staff is definitely very confused with how little communication has been given from administration. Um, like a little bit earlier, like I don't know, maybe a week or two ago actually, um, one of the uh, administration had told uh, the music, the staff, music teachers that they were not allowed to take students and put them into a music program. They were they had no control over pretty much scheduling and which affected a lot of students who had been in the music program for like over two years that got completely taken out. And I know they are doing stuff to fix it now, but still a lot of students are not in the classes that they need to be in. And they've been doing these classes for so long that they don't want to just quit. And I understand that there are budgets and sometimes it's not always the main priority, but it feels like there's not a lot of attention drawn to it because from me being in the music program, I think it's such an important thing and fifth graders coming into our middle school should have the exact same opportunities that I have because they're amazing and that's it. <laughs> Hello, I'm Zaya Corver, and I wanted to talk about the many issues at Washington Middle School. How general education students are not treated equal to their highly capable peers. How people of color rarely have the opportunities nor the guidance to feel confident enough to test into the HCC program. And how students only have the chance to use the restroom freely during 20% of the school day, which is particularly harmful for females because average use time is greater 
the lines are longer, and our opportunities to use the restroom are therefore more limited. The underlying issue at hand is miscommunication with student body. I personally have little to no communication with advisors at WMS, and it has negatively impacted the learning experiences of many. I'm asking you to look at these issues at hand and help to provide the standardization of communication at our school. Thank you. Next up is India Carlson, followed by Emily Lieberman, then Susan McLaughlin. Good evening, school board members. School board goal number one, raise the achievement of all students while narrowing the gaps between the lowest and highest performing students. Student success is tied to literacy. In every subject we, we teach students, they must be able to access, analyze, and communicate information. Without literacy, students cannot be successful in school and beyond high school and beyond. School librarians are the key to literacy. Seattle Public Schools is considering reducing library access by dramatically cutting library staff. My school has one librarian and one assistant serving 2,000 students and over 100 staff, and serve them they do. Curating resources for research projects for students. Curating resources for teachers to bring ethnic studies into their classrooms. Running a makerspace, facilitating book clubs, leading the digital learning cohort, hosting the VR club, and yes, checking out books to students. The current waiting staffing standard proposal would reduce high schools to .5 of a librarian. Reducing library staff means handcuffing the most equitable and accessible space in a school. The school library environment fosters social and academic interaction in a way that no grade level classroom can, as Nell Baker, who spoke earlier as example of the Missoula Book Club, makes so clear. The school library is democracy in action, lifting up all students to achieve the best that they can, and the librarian is the leader of that space. I ask you, no, I demand that the board remember their goals in meeting this budget crisis by not recommending a cut that increases inequities and hurts student achievement. Our students' futures depend on it. Good afternoon. I yield my time to Kathleen Carson. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, our schools are now more segregated than they were a generation ago. That does not just happen. That is the result of deliberate choice, and it will take deliberate choice to undo it, because we know that separate is not equal. The board goals to raise the achievement of all students, and particularly to reduce the gap between the highest and lowest performers, to eliminate racial predictability in all aspects of education, and to ensure that all students of Seattle Public Schools graduate ready for a racially and culturally diverse school. Washington Middle School is a place that that could happen, that those, those goals could be achieved. Um, but the pain of separate and not equal is very apparent and is exasper exacerbated by the decrease in, in resources. We have a community at Washington Middle School that is committed to working toward achieving those goals, um, but we need the support of the board to do that. I yield my spot to Blake Bundesman of Washington Middle School. Hello, my name is Blake. Uh, I'm here to talk about the unexpected schedule changes at Washington Mid Middle School that have again halted learning for everybody um, for many reasons. The students are facing lots of challenges, um, such as classes being mixed up, so classes that were in the middle of projects and assignments, you know, what happens now? We, kids don't have that class anymore. Kids were transferred into those classes and are behind. Um, you know, the teachers and the students don't know each other. They have to learn names. They have to learn policies. Um, they, group projects for, you know, classroom groups yeah, in, time, uh, in class time 
those are all mixed up, people don't have the same classes anymore, what do you do with that? Um, everybody has to new, learn new curriculum and the classes that are in different places, so somebody, some classes are gonna be on different units than others and people are gonna learn stuff repetitively or they're not gonna learn something. Uh, and then we're also, the eliminated, elimination of eighth grade cross-program collaboration uh, has a big impact. We're not gonna be with everybody that we wanted to. Teachers, uh, are, their grading is all messed up. People are in dif different classes. They had short notice and they're, um, they had one day before they learned they would be teaching different classes and different students. And they must start over with curriculums and learning people, so we asked for better funding to support all students at Washington uh, and engagement between school leadership, students and families, so admin telling the kids what they want. Next up is Chris Jackins, followed by council member Shama Sawant, followed by Jeff Tittlebaum. My name is Chris Jackins, Box 84063, Seattle 98124. My compliments, compliments of, to the other good speakers here tonight. On the personnel report, two points. Number one, most of the out of endorsement assignments had an effective date of four months ago. Does board approval four months after the fact comply with state law? Number two, no date is listed for six of the assignments. On the contract to set up portables, what enrollment is the district projecting for next year, and how does it compare to current enrollment? On the Franklin window and door replacement project and on the district headquarters freezer contract. Three points. Number one, has the Landmarks Board already given approval for the Franklin work, or is the district hiring a contractor without having received such approval? Number two, the Franklin item was introduced before the name of the contractor was known and the district is likewise introducing the freezer contract before the name of that contractor is known. Such processes reduce the time for proper review. Number three, years ago, previous school boards were more sensitive about being treated like rubber stamps. The district has a new chief operating officer with valuable experience at the city. Is this how the city does its business? Please vote no. On the composting contract, three points. Number one, the current holder of the contract was the only company to submit a bid. Number two, the report states that the district advertised with the Washington State Office of Minority and Women's Business Enterprises and the minority-owned business trade group Taper 100. Number three, did the district do any outreach to specific such companies beyond advertising? Thank you. My name is Shema Samant. I am on the Seattle City Council and I'm also a member of Socialist Alternative. I am here today in solidarity with the students, teachers, parents, community members who are here for BLM at schools, Black, Black Lives Matter at schools and the NAACP Youth Coalition. I 100% support all their demands including mandatory ethnic studies and counselors, not cops. I am also here in solidarity with two inspiring students from the Seattle Public Schools Natalia McConnell, seventh grade, Asa Mercer Middle School, and Zoe Sherman, eighth grade, Washington Middle School, seventh grade, <laughs> Washington Middle School. In an example that our movement led by us adults should follow, young Natalia and Zoe, directed by their passion to fight for a better world, feel strongly that the bus service in schools in Seattle should be brought in-house as a public entity so that all drivers have the choice of a full-time job and will be paid the same wages and benefits as other public employees of the Seattle public school system. They circulated a petition among their fellow students, a petition rejecting the privatization of bus service and the current contract with first student. Within a few weeks, 
Natalia and Zoe have got 1,003 signatures from their peers. I also want to congratulate the school bus drivers, Teamsters Local 174, on their successful strike action last year. I really urge the school board members to join our fight to tax big business and the wealthy to fully fund public education, meeting all the needs of students, but to make sure that all the workers who work on our public school campuses are public employees with all the benefits and wages attached. And I see the rest of my time to Zoe. Uh, Natalia. Sorry. Can we, can you have a little more time? I'm going to take a point of personal privilege and give you a minute. Hi, I'm Natalia. Um, we are glad to have the opportunity to speak tonight in our complete solidarity with the four essential demands made by our fellow students standing up for Black Lives Matter. We have collected over 1,000 signatures in support of having the school bus service run directly by the school district, the bus drivers paid a living wage, and receiving more health care and retirement benefits that they deserve, as well as on-time bus service for students. When school buses are late, kids miss classes, parents miss work, and everyone gets stressed out because of the uncertainty and lateness of school buses. It disrupts family schedules and education at school. School bus service is a great benefit to our community, but not if it is continually late. Thank you. I'd like to yield my time to one of the students, uh, Mia Weatherby, please. Hi, my name is Mia Weatherby. Bus drivers work really hard. They deserve fair benefit, fair pay, good retirement benefits, and good health care benefits. For many students, riding the school bus is their way to get to school. Without our school bus drivers, there would be lots of students who wouldn't get to school on time. We have taken a stand. We've started a petition to have Seattle Public Schools run their own bus company where all the school bus drivers get fair pay and better benefits. There are over a thousand signatures collected from students from 12 schools. I cede the rest of my time to Grace. My name is Grace Starr. I'm the mother of two children in the Seattle Public School System, one of whom is here. My younger one, however, is on bus 576. We have had less than six um, pickups or deliveries on time this year, and often we have none, um, which has gone on sometimes for weeks. And um, I just want to say that, you know, my husband has been home a lot because I've been in cancer treatment, and so luckily he's been able to take her on days when I haven't been available. But we have a serious equity issue here for families that are not able to take their kids to school in a pinch like this, or, you know, I think it's really unfair to make the kids wait outside for hours. Feed the rest to Zoe Sherman. I'm Zoe Sherman, uh, and we believe it's not acceptable that bus drivers are not paid a living wage and that they receive minimal health care and retirement benefits. We urge you to get rid of first student and instead run the school buses in-house. You have every right to cancel the school bus contract with the first student as they have continually violated their contract with you and owe the district $3.3 million by not providing on-time bus service. Run the bus service in-house and pay the bus drivers a living wage and good health care and good retirement benefits. We are not going to stop with this, and we will keep advocating for the rights of bus drivers, students, can I keep talking for like 10 more seconds, parents and teachers. What are the steps that you are going to take to deal with our concerns when we hear back from you? Next up is Sabrina Burr, followed by Darren Hoop, and then Cliff Meyer. We are here today, this week, to recognize that black lives of our students matter. 
but our lives only matter in this district in words and policies. This district has a belief gap and views black people as colonizers did. You are one of the greatest contributors to the pipeline to prison, murderers of self-esteem and hope. I know firsthand, I witnessed firsthand my baby brother almost 50 years ago. He was stabbed in the heart. The first stab came that changed the trajectory of his life from this district. Both you and his murderer were cause of his death. What I experienced with him, I still witness today, and it is a shame and horrific at what our babies experience daily in Seattle public schools. You say it with your mouth and in your print, but do we really matter? Your actions show us different. The superintendent had listening sessions, but violated parliamentary procedures and canceled a NAACP education meeting with the black community the morning of the event. She colluded with someone who had no authority um, to cancel that event, and it went out in print and media, social media and radio. She had no respect for the black man whose term was still effective and is still the president of the state in NAACP. So do black lives matter? We have schools like Washington Middle School being run like prisons, hall suites, being locked out of classrooms, straight lines, no talking, escorted with security. So do black lives matter? You demote black leaders and promote individuals who are over SPED and HCC, both are racist. Fifty-seven percent of SPED students are of color, and students of color are not represented in HCC. It is not the students, it is the ways and the beliefs of the leaders in this district. North Shore has similar, and they changed it. You say that black lives matter, but best starts for kids. County dollars are coming into buildings through trusted partners from the black community and are being put under someone who doesn't believe in our children or their voice. You are putting the work in the hands of someone who does not believe in family engagement. NTSS is the spinoff of RTI, which had family engagement as a component. The work must be braided with true equity and through that lens. We must honor families and scholars. It must create space for healing, trust building, and true relationships that honor the students and families and what we are built on for whole academic excellence. Seattle Public Schools has a huge opportunity to show through actions that black lives matter. How will you show through your work? Black Lives Matter in school, in executive cabinets, in SPS leadership, in classrooms, and in everything you do. How will you show us with your actions? Uh, hi, I'm Darren Hoop, a substitute teacher at Rainier Beach High School. I cede my time to student from Beach, uh, Israel Presley. Um, in your welcome message, you said, um, Superintendent Juno says, uh, a thriving public education, education system is the foundation of a healthy community, and access to high quality teaching and learning is every student's right. <sighs> if it's truly every student's route, right, <laughs> why is ethnic studies just uh, an elective, you know? If it's, I mean, we were talking about high quality teaching, I haven't really seen none around here. I mean, and the first step to showing that you guys truly care about black lives is actually listening to us. We've came here with the same demands for a very long time, and I have struggled to see any type of change happen. Now, I commend you. Yes, I do commend you for the type of change you have, you have made happen. Um, but I do think it's only fair that a school that hasn't gotten its renovation get the opportunity to get it soon. I mean, we haven't had one. I do go to Rainier Beach, and we have you know, literally panels falling down on us. So, you know, not to, not to come at you guys uh, any disrespectful way, but I'm just kind of tired of sitting here. I've came to you guys previously and literally tried to beg you. How, how many times do I have to throw myself at you for you guys to get the message? The time for change is now. I'm giving you solutions. 
It says it up there. You want a solution? Start educating the kids now so we can make change in the future once y'all go. You know, that's, that's a solution. A solution is educating these kids because we have too many students, not just African American, but also our white students walking around here feeling entitled, going off into the real world struggling when, when, they, when they see people attacking them because they continue to live in this life of ignorance. I mean, they are truly shackled with ignorance. They walk around and we're continue, continually oppressed. This is oppression. This is bigger than just, you know, us voicing what we feel. No, nah, this, is, this is bigger than that. This is actually, look at, look at all these students here to support. Now, I think, I think this is just bigger than my voice. I would encourage you guys to listen intently. Now, again, for us to get the funding we need for ethnic studies, you need to make that a, a required class, a credit, because it's, it's really needed amongst our community. I could go on and on. And you can't go on and on because you've overrun your time by two minutes already. No. It says so 45 seconds, ma'am, but thank you. Goodbye. I'm done. Well, thank this you. shows your true colors, though. Thank you. The next speaker is Cliff Meyer, followed by Sue Stahl, then Allie McKay. Cliff Meyer. and Superintendent Juno. Oh. I'm Cliff Meyer, parent of a Washington Middle School sixth grader and also a Garfield ninth grader. I'm also co-president of the Washington PTSA, although I'm speaking here on my behalf. We have at Washington uh, a, a big problem that relates to your goals. That problem relates to the budget and the process that this board and this school district uses in figuring out where the money goes. That process is not working for Washington Middle School. Let me give you a little example of how to think about this. There happens to be a large bakery near Washington Middle School. You may have smelled the results coming out of it. They have quite a few different types of bread. It takes different recipes, donuts one day, uh, Hawaiian rolls another, you name it. Well, at Washington, we have large populations takes different recipes to educate them. But at Washington, the budget doesn't nearly provide for the needs of those students. There should be Title I money. There should be HCC money. There's $1.5 million coming to us from the state that is not being used for curriculum, not being used to educate students. It's being used for testing that excludes people of color. That's not right. Now, you know about a lot of anger at Washington right now. Now, some of that relates to this budget process. So you, directors and students, uh, school administrators, you have some of this responsibility right now to make the budget process work for everyone at Washington and get the right recipes. Thank you. Suze Stahl is the next speaker, followed by Ali McKay, and then Rosa Powers. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm going to cede most of my time to Jaden, but I just wanted to tell you that last week, on uh, the day between semesters, when a lot of students were sleeping, um, four students from the NAACP Youth Coalition got up very, very early and came up to University of Washington Bothell campus and led my entire two hour long education and society class through a panel discussion and interactive activities about um, the work that they're doing. And it was, uh, it was just so, I, I've worked with this group for a while so I know how great they are, but um, I didn't meet with them ahead of time or anything. I didn't help them plan that presentation. They did the whole two-hour presentation by themselves. And um, I really think that you ought to follow their example. 
and I'm going to cede the rest of my time to Jaden. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jaden Thomas. I'm a junior at Franklin High School. And what I just wanted to say, one of our demands is um, hiring more um, staff of color, but it's also a point to retain the staff of color that we already have. Because if you're hiring five staff of color, it doesn't matter if you just let 10 staff go due to budget cuts or if they left. And then also creating an environment that the staff of color feels safe in. Because I know certain staff of color like Roosevelt or Nathan Hale have had times when they don't feel safe in their own work environment. And that's why we have issues getting um, that's why we have issues getting staff of color within the school district because it's just they're not they don't feel safe in their place that they work. So why would you want to work in a place that you don't feel safe in or go to a place in general that you're not going to feel welcome or safe in? Thank you. Hello, my name is Allie McKay. I'm a parent of a first and a third grader at Lowell Elementary. I'm also the Seattle lead for an organization called Integrated Schools. First, I would like to thank the NAACP sorry, Youth Coalition for organizing, speaking up, and demanding progress. I believe that integration and effective dismantling of white supremacy will require that we effectively educate all of our students, especially our students of color, Therefore, I very strongly support and believe we should implement immediately the four demands of the Black Lives Matter in school. <laughs> First, end zero tolerance in the school to prison pipeline, focus on restorative justice. Second, um, hire more black teachers and make sure they stay, that they want to stay and that they can stay. Third, Black history should be more than just one month. It should be year round as well as ethnic studies as has been eloquently said by all of the students. Fourth, fund counselors, not cops. I know our school has counselors and it's very effective, but I think every school needs them and they should be trained in how to effectively deal with everyone and be supportive of everyone's cultures. And finally, um, I will just say that I think all of these demands help our students of color, but they will also help all of our students become better citizens. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rosa Powers. I teach at Garfield High School, proud union member and member of Seattle Equity Educators. I just want to talk really briefly about the fact that ethnic studies gets no bad reviews at our school, none. And that's really, really rare. Um, it excites students, and this is the kind of curriculum that we educators are being pushed to do in our schools. And I'd like to see the district push white educators more to make this happen within their curriculum. I'd like to um, cede the rest of my time to uh, community organizer and all-around dynamo, Deontay Damper. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here today, especially behind this beautiful youth that is really ready to impact the world. But they can't do that without being educated on, on all lives, but more in particular, black lives. Going to high school at Rainier Beach, I had, an, I had an, a, there was an assistant teacher, a counselor, and I'm looking at her right now, and she wouldn't even expect for an LGBT man to be sitting up in here. I owned it. I own who I am. So, so LGBT lives, trans lives, needs to be educated within the school system. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah, some people are going to get mad, but we, they're mad because we don't know. They're not educated on it. Ms. Betty, you educated me on standing up for myself, and it's because of that why I'm here on a podium like this. Black Lives Matter, you told me that even before it became true, before it came to existence here. And all I'm asking y'all, will y'all follow Betty? Because I know she's standing up for it. And will you follow these kids back here? Because they're giving you the message for it. And will you follow me? Because I'm a community leader. I work for POCAN. And in the summertime, we get these kids. So we need to be passing the baton back and forth, honey. That's all. Thank you. Next speaker is John Greenberg, followed by Monique Stallings, and then Alice Fong. Hello, I cede my time to JJ Hall. Hello, um, 
So I'm here with the uh, NAAC, uh, NAACP Youth Coalition, and I just come here to say that we do need ethnic studies in our group, in our schools, and we need that, we need that to be a graduation requirement because we're not gonna learn. I'm tired of learning from like one point of view, like oh, this is a Eurocentric point of view. This is the white people's point of view. This is um what white people saw this is what they learned. I'd rather learn it from different cultures. So like when I grow up, I can be able to work with people who are many different cultures and be able to like know what they've been through, you know, know what has happened to their culture and like know how to act around them. And like the thing is like how do you think people like turn out to be the way they are? They they don't just become who they are. They learn like how do you think like racist people they don't just become racist. They 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 get taught uh, they get taught those ways, and you know it's hard because like if you like you you guys you guys are in charge of it all. So if you don't teach your kids to learn to have a mindset of different like ethnic like personalities and points of view, then we're not gonna grow up learning that there's different people out there in the world. And they believe different stuff from us, but that's okay because in the end, we're just all the same. And we need to, like, be able to kind of target that because that's a problem in today's, like, people are going against each other because they they believe the different things, but, like, they can't agree on it, so they just argue with each other. We need to learn just to, you know, let people have their opinions and just learn from it. So that's all I have to say. SPS has failed our children and family of color. How they irresponsibly give uneducated, and I don't mean academic wise, I mean culturally. They give uneducated people jobs who don't care about our children, who are so blinded by their privilege to not even see and sometimes try to justify their racism. Change has to start with the educators before it can begin to take place with, with students of privilege. If educators are still biased, racist, and culturally incompetent, how will students change? Building educators' culture, co cultural competence and adding more people of color to your employee roster is a great start. We are not interested in what projects or programs the district is working on putting, school, putting in schools if they aren't worried about what's going on in our schools. We're not interested in what school staff or district members have done for former schools when our families and children of this school district aren't benefiting from it. Families of color ancestors have shed more blood than your lineage will shed in a lifetime. Our families and generations have been and continue to be cut short because of hate and racism. Our children continue to be treated less than in the world and even in the schools. School is supposed to be a safe haven. It tends to be one of the worst places in the country to children and families of color. All because some people like you all, the ones with the power to make a change, simply won't. You rather cover and protect wicked SPS employees than protect the ones that have very little to no voice. But then you watch the news and talk horribly of the murderers and the thieves and the rapists and the abusers and the pedophiles and such. Do you, do you ever ask yourself, are you just as bad or worse? Because a child's first words and steps still w start with the parents. But after that, it starts there first. Everything else is with their school and the staff members in it. If, our <coughs> if hearing that you're worth it at home and then go to school seven hours, five days a week, and their educational parents mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically break them down every day. And then they and their families both stand up for them, and when nothing happens, they ask, fam they ask their, the higher up in the SPS to help like the superintendent, but get no answer, not even an email from the superintendent's office. How different are you from the persons I just stated, and how 
Does a mother like me believe anything that comes out of a person's mouth like you when there is constantly no change? Black lives do matter. The next speaker is Alice Fong, followed by uh, the Honorable Michael B. Fuller, followed by Andrea Radosevich. Hello, my name is Alice Fong, and I concede my spot to Brandon Kennedy. Good evening. Um, my name is Brandon Kennedy, uh, and I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, the 32 awardees under King County's Best Starts for Kids. We, are, we represent 17 of those that are directly invested in Seattle Public Schools. And uh, out of those 17, um, we have 9.5 million that are invested in Seattle, our King County's Best Starts for Kids Trauma-Informed Restorative Practices Grant. I'm here tonight to tell you you guys have an incredible resource on, on your hands um, and at your disposal. Right now we are working in partnership with Seattle Schools and we are a collective strategy meant to address all the things that you're hearing tonight. Um, people under our grant, out of these 17 awardees, are doing all of this work that, you're, that people are asking you to uh, do within your schools. And what we're asking is for us to be classified under the uh, uh, proper initiative. Right now, um, our uh, grant strategies are classified under the multi-tiered uh, multi system um, support, and this is a misalignment. The work that we are doing is equity work. And uh, we advocate that our work be moved under Dr. Brent Jones um, because it is equity work, uh, specifically the Department of Racial Equity. And um, I just want to take a moment uh, to go off script for a second and say, that school right there, Madrona K-8, I work in that school every day. And it's amazing to see this up here on the wall. And it's amazing to see all of these scholars out here today asking you, um, each and every one of you guys to lend your voice and help out in this work. And what we want to do is we want to give these scholars peace of mind that the work that we're doing is going to be properly classified under equity, that we can address these concerns that people are coming to you and asking you for, and you already have people in the field willing to do this work. And we want to ensure that our work is going to be supported by the school board in the proper channels that we're able to do equity work. And if I could take two more seconds to just say, reach out a hand, let everybody know, give them peace of mind, move uh, best starts for kids, um, trauma-informed and restorative practices in the school environment under Dr. Brent Jones' uh, Department for Racial Equity. And um, thank you for your time. Thank you for letting me speak to you tonight. I'm Honorable Michael Fuller, Sue I. Jewel. Uh, I'm devastated with all eight of you on that, on that board. I don't know what I'm working with. If you don't like black folk, what you here for? Because Black Lives Matter, this is not to change or dream Black Lives Matter can but easy. I'm moved for cease and desist. Violation of 42.52020, meaning activities incompatible with public duty. And 98.36080, malicious harassment. And 49.60030, freedom from discrimination. And the violation of the American with Disability Act, July 26, 1990, and Sex 504, the Rehabilitation Act, 1973, and the Civil Rights Act, of 1968, that was signed by Lyndon Johnson. I'm dealing with organized crime control up here. Pimping we the people. But do you know who I am? I've been in this business way before this building was built, talking about Black Lives Matter and our children. And audacity of hope, pimping we the people. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? In my neighborhood, what's wrong with you? But the blood of Jesus. Yes. It's a good shot. Yeah. The blood of Jesus. Well, 
Hi, Andrea Radosevich. We, the families of Washington Middle School, are here tonight to sound the alarm bell. Washington Middle School is in crisis, and the district's policy of site-based management is failing us. Site-based management was intended to give principals the flexibility to tailor their approach to the specific school community, but instead, in practice, it can have exactly the opposite effect. It can allow principals to make decisions that are incredibly harmful to a school community, and it leaves families with no recourse. Were world languages eliminated at your school? Sorry, we can't help you, site-based management. Are students at your school prevented from using the bathroom? Do your classes have 38 kids in them? Are teachers moved around mid-year to teach subjects they've never taught before? Has your student had nine different schedules so far this year? Sorry, we can't help you, site-based management. The PTSA has requested meetings with the WMS principal, the superintendent, and other district staff to discuss these and many other issues at WMS, and all have refused to meet with us. This is not about HCC. The chaos and upheaval at Washington Middle School are having a negative impact on all the students in the school, both in HCC and in the general education program. When the policy of site-based management becomes a policy of passing the buck, it harms our poor and immigrant children and it harms our South End schools. I said earlier that site-based management leaves families with no recourse. That's not quite true. When families have no voice in their school, they vote with their feet. For the first time in my eight years as a parent at Thurgood Marshall, all the fifth grade families are looking for other alternatives other than Washington Middle School. We are in danger of becoming a failed school and we need your help. Superintendent, we ask that you put one more stop on your listening tour and please come listen to us at WMS. And to the board and the district, please step in to assure that students at WMS get a decent education and one that is not drastically different than at any other Seattle Middle School. Thank you. The next speaker is Max Summers. I'd like to speak with Quentin Flight as well. So, um, yeah. Hi, I'm Max Summers. Hi, I'm Quentin Flight. Hi, I'm Quentin Flight, and, and we're graders at Washington Middle School. As you may have heard, there have been many issues, or you obviously have heard, uh, with student voice and communication at Washington. And our reason for coming here today is to try to spread awareness to help stop these things from happening. As an eighth grader with the new administration continuing to add unexpected and even unreasonable changes at our school has been really tough. And added, we never really understand what's happening as a result of poor communication to students, staff, and parents. Especially impacting was the switching of student schedules last Tuesday. We had teachers that we had spent the entire year getting to know and getting to learn with that we were suddenly separated from and now don't know anymore. Students in different programs were put in, a, in way different environments, some too uncomfortable for many like me, and that made us wonder what were the actual uh, purposes of mixing everything up. Last Thursday, we held a student organized protest out of our school for student voice and administrative communication. Along with that, we wrote a letter on what we want to change in our school and how we want our administration to acknowledge student input. We have that letter right here with us. Unfortunately, we've never received a response from anybody from the district or from our administration uh, concerning what happened on Thursday and how we expressed our concerns. So we came here today to hope that our voice is heard. As a black kid in special education, I feel I especially don't have a voice and with all the change and miscommunication in our school, I can't really be heard. I, and this on the top of all the racial biases present in our building, which have affected many people in our school, I feel if I had more of a voice in school decisions, I could change the way people like me are treated. And I'll also have more of a sense of community at Washington. In a world where so many people don't have a voice and are biased against, that shouldn't be reflected in our own school. In a school district that values student voice as much as it does, I know you have a leadership board for high school students. We hope you understand our lacks of concern, uh, our concerns with lack of representation in our own school. We have, oh, we want the best future for our educations and any other students in the future. But if these problems don't stop happening at our school, then things are never going to get better. And all we want is a voice. That was our 25th speaker. Uh, I'd like to request Ty Wong to speak from the wait list. I, I'm sorry. We.
Go for it. But guys, let's not set precedent here because it's crazy making running these meetings, okay? Yes. Go for it. Um, hello, my name is Tai Wong. I am a seventh grader at Washington Middle School. And there are many kids that play an instrument at our school. Uh, they are in the music program. And for me, music is very important to me because it is my favorite class in school and I learn lots. We need to keep the music program running because the administration has made it harder <coughs> sorry, uh, for students to learn in music. They have combined two orchestras in one, then uh, they did the same with the band. With too many students in class, it can make it harder to learn. Thank you. Okay, we are going back to board comments and those board members that have already commented that want to um, reflect on what they've heard during public testimony are welcome to do so. And um, it would be my suggestion that we have board comments and then we move into action item first, the personnel report that came off of the consent agenda then move into action item C1 to adopt the resolution that Black Lives Matter, which was amended this afternoon. And uh, let's do that and then take our break after C1. Do I have consensus? I see head nodding. Director Geary, your board comments please, Adam. Well, thank you so much, everybody. And while I hear you that you don't feel the change, I see the change. I see the change by you being here. Um, and it's not fast enough, for sure. I hear that. But you are here, and that's a change for me in the amount of time, in the three years that I've set up here. That you're showing up shows me you are experiencing a change for the positive, for the positive in you, and for the positive in everybody who's in your presence. So I know it's exhausting. I know for some of you it can be scary because you may be the one voice in your building and I take that very seriously. I think of Israel's words about how it's so important, not just for you that we have mandatory ethnic studies, but for students, the students who are predominantly in my schools in District 3. Um, many of you are familiar with what happened at Roosevelt High School, and that community needs mandatory ethnic studies. That community needs to have the professional development around these issues, the bias training. But it is not the community that is first in line when there's a limited budget, but we need to get through that faster. And I'm gonna say thank you to the grace that was shown from the NAACP and from the Black Student Union at Roosevelt High School in addressing that issue and recognizing, because they could have been a lot more angry and a lot more inflammatory, I think, but I think they showed up with grace and they used it as an opportunity to show how important it is that we get this education everywhere. Because if we don't, then the student that drew that picture, he goes out tomorrow and what's gonna happen to him? He's gonna be hitting walls and people are gonna be telling him he's wrong and we didn't educate him that his privilege wasn't something that he could take out in the world and be expected to be met with no resistance. We didn't teach him the perspective of others. We didn't teach him how to reflect upon his own place in this world. So thank you so much for being here and I hear you and I want this work to continue. We are gonna talk more about our resolution and I have some more comments then, so I don't wanna go on. I just wanna say that I see a change. Um, thank you to Washington Middle School folks. Um, the opening, uh, what's happened at Washington Middle School is particularly difficult for me to see because it is one of those situations where I feel like we must continue to raise expectations around education and that music shouldn't be diminished but it should be encouraged that everybody participates in it so that there are the resources and there is the enrollment in those classes. Music is for everyone in a school. Languages, is for, uh, languages are for everyone in a school. 
We cannot lower the expectations around education by eliminating the courses that are so important. We need to make sure that every student is prepared to go into them and to benefit from them. So we hear you. I know this is something the board has been talking about. I will let other directors um, weigh in on their comments. But for me, we need to continue to raise the expectations about the education we're going to offer to all of our kids. And that when a student goes to a Washington Middle School or to any of our other middle schools, they are met with the same robust, rigorous, healthy educational options. I don't know where we find the money, but that's, that is important to me. And then um, I'm just going to take the final opportunity um, to say that I did meet with a community member, and it was brought to my intention that um, they're going to be opening the housing at Magnuson in April. And so we're going to see an influx of students into the um, Sandpoint, probably Laurelhurst, Thornton Creek, Eckstein um, Middle School area. And that I'm just asking my staff to be aware of that and to think of ways that we can support the schools that are going to all of a sudden get a lot more students in when, as you know, our head counts are in October. Um, other schools that have had principals who've had to deal with an influx from housing, maybe we can make sure that our principals have a group um, and know who that they can talk to about the issues that they may be seeing around this issue. How do we prepare our community for a known change? And how do we learn from the mistakes in the past that we have seen when we've had sudden influx of community into a school that wasn't properly prepared for it? I put everybody on notice because I've talked to some people. Some are aware of this happening. Some people are not aware of it happening. I put us as a district on notice that this is going to happen and we need to be prepared for it so that our schools are not left unsupported. I continue to have my community meetings every Tuesday morning. Um, once in a while, there will be a snow day, something will happen, and I don't have an opportunity to have it. Um, check my Facebook page. I will post in the morning whether or not I will be there. It is from 8 to 9.30 at Zoka on Blakely um, almost every Tuesday morning. Um, so I would welcome anybody coming and sitting down with me and sharing their thoughts. Thank you. Again, I'm so proud to see my students, to see Seattle students here talking to us. Congratulations to you. Next up, Director Patu. Thank you. Good evening. It's really a privilege and excited to see all the students who came tonight and really talk about what needs to happen and what is it that's going on within your schools. Uh, I didn't realize that ethnic studies was not a requirement in our school district, which is really kind of sad because um, that is a subject that should have been actually a mandatory for all schools in Seattle Public Schools. And hopefully that's something that we can do to move that forward because we need to learn about each other. And there's no way that we're going to be able to get along if we don't know each other's culture, what makes each other tick. So hopefully as a school board director, I would like to see that being mandatorily put into the schools as part of our courses that needs to be uh, in place for all students to be able to learn. Thank you so much for all the students who came tonight and really voice your opinion. Unless you come and tell us what's going on, there's not very much that we really don't know. We may know a few things, but unless you come and communicate with us exactly what's going on in your school, it helps us to be better aware and what is it that we can do as board directors to make things better for you because we want the best education that we can provide for all our Seattle Public School students. No matter what ethnic group or what color you are, that everyone deserves an excellent education. And that's something that I, as a board director, would like to see. Um, we've heard a lot of stuff tonight, but it really saddened me to realize that, you know, things need to be better. We need to step up and be able to continue to look at what other ways that we can provide the best education that we can. And hopefully that every student have that opportunity and not be able to be left out because there's certain things that's not happening in Seattle Public Schools. Um, and I really am, you know, it, it's exciting to have kids the opportunity, have the students opportunity to come and tell us 
what is going on. Because as a board director, we don't always know what's going on. Uh, you know, we tend to hear things here and there, but the best way for us to be able to really see or hear what's going on is having you come down and actually telling us what's happening. So thank you for coming in and share what's going on in your schools, what's going on with you, because that is what makes the world go around when we all know what each other's needs is and how can we be able to help support each other in terms of what we do here. And uh, I'm really um, excited about what's going on tonight. I've been on the board for a long time, but I've never heard so many complaints. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's exciting and sad at the same time. So hopefully, as a board director, I would like to see some things move forward and hopefully to make sure that ethnic study is in every school so that every student have a chance to learn about each other's culture. Thank you. Next up, Director Pinkham, please. Tats Kalat and Katsiaya and Nim Scott Pinkham Nim and Kasa Somalok. Thank you all for being here this evening. I appreciate it. Uh, <clears throat> you know, when we had uh, Native American Month, Hispanic Month, Latinas Month, we all have our own need to express ourselves. And when our schools are limiting that expression, it's no good. We're, we're not, then we're being <coughs> exclusive of, of people. Black lives do matter, you know, that all lives matter. And when you speak up and say, hear me, hear me now, we, we're we here to listen. And, uh, and sometimes the bureaucracy gets in the way. You know, how can we get this? How can we get ethnic studies adopted as fast as we can? Well, we have steps we have to go through to get there. And for me, it's learning that system. And how fast can we speed this up? Because for me, I go back to a, a student of mine that I had in my class, and he talked about this word antilocution. And this is where we have systems set up in, unfortunately, with our schools that will say something about another out group but not allow that out group to have a voice and say and defend themselves. I'm seeing now that you're kind of been defending yourselves and we should all defend ourselves. No, what you were teaching in school is not correct. It needs to change. We need to provide voices of different perspectives to come in and learn this. And one of that way is through ethnic studies, but it's also gonna be enrolled in other subjects because there's a lot of people that contributed to this great country. And I want to see this country continue to evolve and so that we do have this multicultural, multi-perspective, and it's not seen as one is better than the other, but we all come together and we're raising each other up one by one. So again, thank you for being here. And those of you that are students, please keep on pushing, knowing, challenging your teachers as much as you can. Hey, no, this isn't correct. Let me share my perspective, how I was taught, how my family taught me what it meant to be who I am and where we came from. Uh, continue that and become that next teacher. Become the next administrator so we can make these changes. It is happening. You know, probably not too many years ago, they wouldn't even thought about making such a change. But now that you're here sharing your voice, you're standing up and saying, no, this is not right. Keep it up. Keep pushing us. Make sure that we go on the path, because that's what I want to see, that one thing is to have all of our educators make state of Washington require ethnic studies or diversity education in their certification to teach in the <coughs> state of Washington. That's part of the certification process. Students at the University of Washington pushed for diversity credits to graduate with a bachelor's degree. It was the students that did that. It took them a while to do it. But it is a requirement now at the University of Washington to have a diversity credit to get your bachelor's degree. So keep pushing us. Ethnic studies is there. How fast can we get there? For me, not fast enough. For you, <laughs> yeah, not fast enough. But we need to keep on pushing. Trust me, we will get there. Um, also, just want to acknowledge our student speaker as well. You know what she shared here: the importance of librarians. Yes, you know that's where we need to go and get the books and teach our students how to read, not only in English, but other languages as well. Make everyone aware of different perspectives, again, through just uh, language itself. Um, thank you to the Seattle Hotel Association, $4,500, and to continue on with the programs that we have or to make them better. Uh, 
uh, <clears throat> Washington Middle School, you know, parents, students come here sharing your voice, uh, site-based management, our management, to we'd rather come to a, a system that works for everyone. You know, have Washington Middle School maybe look at other middle schools, how are they surviving? How are they getting by? You know, what happened in this case? And we gotta learn from it, not try to hide it. Um, <coughs> other comments, excuse me here, I'm, I'm kinda losing my voice, I'm getting over a cold. Um, And I'm going to go home with a numb mouth if uh, <coughs> Dr. Harris keeps on pushing these cough drops on me. Uh, <coughs> but uh, I guess just get back to sharing your voice. And I try to introduce myself in my native language, and I'm still learning it. I encourage others you know, to learn your, I learn another language, and it can help uh, shed some lights on it. Uh, so shed some light on other perspectives. Uh, bureaucracy, uh, yeah, unfortunately, got in the way of our Urban Native Education Alliance meeting this past Thursday where they got to the building and, oops, sorry, you can't come in because they said their permit wasn't renewed. Somewhere in our system, things got lost and a lot of people showed up, including some of our elders, and they got locked out. That's been addressed, but again, bureaucracy kind of got in the way. What can we do uh, better as a school district so such things don't happen again? But they will be back again this Thursday evening. Uh, they weren't there Tuesday because all schools were closed. There's some things that we can't control, such as the weather. Uh, please come out there, and it's not just for Native students, but if you want to learn more about Native culture in general, uh, please join us. Uh, there's always free dinner there uh, <coughs> on Thursday nights, Tuesdays and Thursdays. And if you're into basketball, they encourage you to come out there and shoot some hoops with them as well. Uh, that's a Thursday nights at Robert Eagle Staff, Lincoln Springs, and Sundays for back, uh, ba basketball, it's at Bitter Lake uh, Community Center, sometimes at Broadview Thompson. Um, my next meeting is actually going to be in March, March 9th, from 12 to 1.30 at Lake City uh, Library. I'm eager to see what Lake City Library looks like. Just recently went through renovation. <coughs> and... That's all I have. Again, Katsuyayo, Black Lives Matter. Direc Director DeWolf. Yep. Thank and you. then Director Mack. Yes. And then Director Burke. Um, I just uh, first want to say, um, y'all, I'm so excited you're here. Um, you are really what has inspired me to keep working at this, and so I promise we are working our butts off, and have some, we'll have some really great developments coming up the next couple of months. You're right that this is, is really good to affirm our values in this type of a resolution, but we gotta, we got to show up with some action, and so I, I want to at least preview that we're coming. Um, we hear your requests for ways to make our schools more racially equitable and actually valuing the lives of our students of color, particularly our black students, so we'll have some good updates for, uh, uh, very shortly on that. I do want to elevate something that um, one of our parents from Washington Middle School um, raised on, I think it was on one of our uh, kind of family parent groups on Facebook. Um, and they met with uh, Senator Jamie Peterson recently, and he said he has received only two messages about public education and funding. And I elevate this because what I've been trying to say at, at many of our school board meetings is it is a critical to tell us your needs and issues but if you are not telling your state legislators from your legislative district, then the issues that we're talking about are really small um, uh, budgets. They're never addressed at the level where folks can actually make a difference in increasing revenue sources or, or making sure that there's actual the right money, particularly because the ways in which we define basic education is defined by whiteness, by, ab by ability, by privilege, by folks that aren't um, experiencing different issues in their lives, particularly students that are experiencing homelessness. So I just encourage you, please continue to tell us your issues, but always CC your state legislators because if they don't know what's going on at the school, school district, then we don't have the ability to let them know because it sounds like we're just saying the same thing over and over again. But it is your critical voice as folks, as our neighbors, as our voters, as constituents. You have to elevate the fact that public education funding is is not ample, they didn't fully fund it, and they haven't any fixed the issue, but they got to put out the headline last year that they did. The only other thing I wanna say is, um, I hope um, if, if there's students here, I was just wondering if you could just quickly raise your hands. Students. students. All, students. All students. Seriously, this is awesome. So, I may not, 
I may not be able to look at each and every one of you individually because of where you're sitting in the audience, but I swear I just want you to know that you matter. You matter to this district. You matter to this board. And yes, it is slow, and I'm sorry about that, but I promise we're coming with some good stuff. And so I just want you to know you matter today, you matter tomorrow, you matter all the way until you graduate. Thank you so much for being here. Well, you, you matter more than that, I'm just saying. <laughs> sorry. And. <laughs> Director Mack. Your public testimony is what drives me to do the work that needs to be done in this district. It is, as it's been stated, bureaucratic. It is complex. It is severely underfunded. And the problems are rife throughout. And I come to this job every day feeling like there are so many challenges here and I can't fix it all, and I want to. I am, <laughs> I so want to, and that's why I know I'm here and I know that the rest of our board directors are here giving of their time and passions and um, skill set to make a difference. The affirmation into action statement that was made by one of the students earlier completely resonates because we have to identify what the problem is and figure out what the potential solutions are. So I, I'm so grateful for the voices coming here re reiterating over and over that here's the solutions. The solutions is ethnic studies. It is. It's something we need to do more of. Funding counselors, not cops, preach, <laughs> frankly. Something that, you know, we talked about this at the work session um, for FEP, that truancy officers are not the same things as family support workers. And we've got to be really clear on providing the supports and, uh, to students that are supportive of our communities and not furthering the prison to um, the, the school to prison pipeline. Um, all of the students and the folks that come out here today that don't feel like their voices matter, I. It breaks my heart that you feel that because it is incredibly impactful. Um, and we are making steps and change is happening. It may not be as fast as everyone else has said. Um, I, um, I really also appreciate the, the statements around site-based management and the WSS allocations. We have challenges in our district around how those things work and where, how dollars come down. And what do we do when we have schools that need mitigation dollars and how do, we, how do we do that? How do we make budget cuts when we are looking at a $50 million shortfall next year and we, we have to make cuts somewhere and where does that happen? Um, I said it again, I said it last week, and I'm gonna say it again because I cannot agree to the WSS cuts that we are having to do and I did not concede on that point. We have to make cuts somewhere, but librarians is the wrong place. High school is the wrong place. And I don't have a perfect solution, but I don't agree with where we're at. So um, the where we're at is not, I don't have control over that either. I have spent the last how many years trying to fight for funding at the state level? And we still have that fundamental problem. Our legislators absolutely need to hear from you. They need to hear, we need to fund counselors. Because that's part of the reason why we're in this deficit. They're not fully funding our counselors. They're not fully funding librarians. We don't have that funding. So vote, because your voice here matters so much. It impacts us, but you got to vote. And you've got to talk to your legislator, and you've got to find those specific actions and work on those. And so all of you that have come here with, those, with, with all of that, I'm just so grateful that you're advocating and, and pushing us and continue pushing us. Um, so thank you. Director Burke. My colleagues have been so eloquent on this that I will just sort of ditto some things. Director Geary, the way you described the grace and how the um, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the underlying, the needs behind it and how it's been growing, um, how it's been communicating, 
um, has been amazing. Um, my perspective, you know, I come on the board as a white male, and people ask me, why would you do that school board thing? That's, that seems terrible. And all I can say is sit in this chair and listen to the amazing students and the passion and what they bring and how they change adults. So your voices, your experiences are shaping our hearts, our minds. Um, I know it's shaping mine from the experiences that I had going through school and growing up and what that looked like. And hearing from you what you want yours to look like is changing how I view our policy work, our priorities, our budget. So please don't feel like you're not being heard. Don't feel like it's not impactful because for me, as an individual, it's huge. And so I just want to share that gratitude. Um, the, the other thing I just, I'm, I'm actually going to quote our um, Eliminating the Opportunities Gap poster that we have on the second floor that's a historical diorama of a lot of the work that's been done there. And there's a, there's a, a quotation up there that's often used and, and referred to as a uh, historical African prover proverb. And I haven't heard if that's true or not, but I will just repeat that, that this is, you know, if you want to go quickly, go alone. And if you want to go far, then go together. And I think that that's a theme that ties together all of this conversation around ethnic studies. The, the people that are bringing this to, to us, the board, to me as an adult that went through a completely different experience in high school and throughout my, my upbringing, um, you're bringing me along with you. And I, and I just want to share that gratitude. And so I'm going to flip that same thing over to the Washington Middle School families um, and acknowledge that what's happening is not going together. Um, and so there's, a, there's change. Potentially, there's need for change. But there's not a coalition that's been built. There's not a, a common need that's been built. And so I just want to share my hope that um, that that can be a, a relationship of trust that gets built because when you try to make change without trust, it creates disruption. But when you make change within dis within trust, then it, it, it tightens up a community. So I, I really want for us as a board and central office to work with uh, the Washington Mid Middle School community to really focus on trust because then I think that will help solve a lot of the site-based challenges. Thank you. Um, but again, thank you for coming and sharing your voice with us. It's huge. OK, last but not least, um, many, many, many thanks for you being here. Many thanks for your emails, your phone calls, your showing up at community meetings, your um, communicating with each other, on all kinds of social media. Um, anytime we communicate with each other, I think we win. Um, I think that we have made progress. Have we made enough? No, absolutely not. But again, I will speak for this board at the dais. Every one of us here is committed to that change. And we have done some good things. Please recall that when we set up the BEX-5 capital ask list, we gave double the points for race and equity that we did for others. And we did that in recognition of the high needs that we have and the disparate treatment and the decades of um, can't find the right word without being combative, and I'll stop there. Um, I'm proud of that work. I'm proud of the package we put together for the BEX-5 and the Excellence and Opportunity Levy. I'm very proud of it. I'm very proud of the fact that our teachers and our staff, our labor partners, Seattle Education Association, put in $50,000 to make darn sure that we don't go a whole heck of a lot more broker than we already are. 
And even if those levies pass, we're still looking at a 45 to $50 million deficit because we live in a state that has an inequitable funding structure. We don't have the money to buy a bus fleet. We have never had a bus fleet in the Seattle Public Schools. I appreciate Council Member Salant. I appreciate the young people that put together that petition, but it is beyond unrealistic. We are broke now. We're not buying a bus fleet. We can't afford it. Capital cost to buy it, to maintain it, and as we very well know, there is no place to park them. That has caused us more trouble than um, we can count. Ethnic studies. Thanks to our partners in helping put together curriculum, social equality educators, some of our other um, community partners, Seattle Education Association, and my, how far we've come in the last three years. Again, fast enough? <coughs> no. Black Lives Matters curriculum, same issues. We're getting there. Whole lot different than it was three years ago. Um, I, being a betting person that I am, would suggest to you that at least a couple of board members will probably bring a resolution to make ethnic studies a graduation requirement. So we will have real difficulty figuring out how to fit that into our bandwidth to do it right, because it takes staff and it takes money and we're broke. So that, stay tuned for that very, very lively conversation. It is in fact coming and I suspect that um, there will be disagreement, but in our work with staff and with each other, we're pretty respectful about it. Stay tuned for the CNI committees. That's where the real work happens, is in the boardroom around the corner. Um, it matters, it matters greatly, and we have to put our beliefs and frankly our money where our mouths are. But we don't have any money, and I'm gonna keep saying it. And I hope there will be a day in the near future where we do not have to sound like the poppers that we are. Um, community meetings, February 16th, Del Ridge Library, three to five. It is lasagna day. You are more than welcome. They are rowdy, they are full, they are passionate meetings. Staff is absolutely invited and those staff that have shown up have appreciated the candid, robust conversation. March 16th, again a Saturday, three to five, at the High Point Library, and you're back to a one in three chance of getting lasagna. Uh, wanna shout out a couple congrats and thank yous, and then we're gonna move to the personnel report and action item number one, the Black Lives Matter resolution, and then take a break. Um, I had an exceptionally good meeting on policy number 2015 and 2020 and superintendent procedures, which is about adopting curriculum and waivers with uh, Chief Academic Officer, Dr. Diane DeBacker, Dr. Kyle Kenoshida, who is, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Kenoshida, I, the titles I can't keep up with, and um, with Associate General Counsel Ronald Boy. Um, if you think we're not listening, you ought to see my kitchen table with the 22 linear feet of paper and homework. Um, these are important things, whether or not we get good curriculum, whether or not we have variances, et cetera. Last piece that I wanna point out and um, suggest that I am most in favor of is the NAACP Youth Coalition uh, demands. I'm in favor of most all of them, but the zero tolerance policy 
is a problem because state statute controls us. That's not something we can do. If a student brings a gun to school, we have extreme uh, legal responsibilities that are in the Washington Administrative Code and in the Revised Code of Washington where even if we wanted to, we could not offer restorative justice. There are some mandatory crimes that equal safety, that equal crimes that are against other people or the risk of that, we don't have that authority. Everything else couldn't agree with you more. And I am um, very pleased to have this conversation and we are moving into the person. Did you want to speak, Director Gary? Just very quickly, I, I forgot one comment that I wanted to call out a thank Have you. Have at it, please. To, to Nell Baker um, and her book club and um, the topic of Sexual Awareness Week. I think that was one that we as a board will be looking into more and it got lost. There were a lot of really important issues but that's one I think that is really relevant to our kids. Um, it's relevant to lots of different kinds of kids. It really touches on identity safety in a very deep way. And so I didn't hear us recognize that, um, but I wanted to call out a thank you for her coming and talking about that. And we'll, we'll be looking forward to something um, to document that in April. Okay, thanks. Okay, and my last wrap up is Chief South International High School took the Ethics Bowl State Championship last week, District 6. Okay. The personnel report was taken off the consent calendar. Who is going to make the motion? I move approval of the Human Resources Personnel Report. Second. I see Dr. Clover Codd at the podium. Would you like to uh, respond to some of the public comments we heard? Can I just ask, actually, um, we have so many things to get through tonight, and I think just uh, the reason why I pulled it off was just to respond at least to um, kind of the, the main question that he's asking here, whether or not it's, whether or not we're complying with state law, and I think the answer is yes, but I just want that confirmation. That's and my I'd one like question. an explanation because we're creating a public record. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Uh, so Clover Cog, Chief Human Resources Officer. So I believe the question was, um, why is uh, the board sort of retroactively approving of the um, out of endorsed teacher assignments? Uh, so first of all, I'd like to explain uh, that we don't receive the report from OSPI until late October um, with respect to who is in endorsement or out of endorsement. So if you remember, we have fall adjustments, master schedules are shifting, teachers are shifting, schedules are being made, those get reported to the state, the state gives a report back to us that says these teachers are out of endorsement. If you remember, substitute teachers can teach any subject in any grade out of endorsement. We still have to list them on the report if they're in a long-term position. Um, again, we have a half-time person who has multiple things on her plate, and one of her tasks is to research each one of these individuals, goes, uh, talks to the school teacher, talks to the principal, finds out if they're truly out of endorsement, puts it on the report, um, and then makes sure that there's a plan in place for each one of these teachers. These are certificated teachers. Um, these, are, these, are, um, these are very well qualified people to be teaching our students. An example is one person might have a chemistry endorsement, but they're asked in the first semester to teach a section of biology, but they don't have a biology endorsement, but they're a perfectly qualified teacher. If the board, if we were to have the board approve of these out of endorsement assignments before the teachers begin teaching, we would have to start with substitutes in all of these classrooms, of which are already may not be in the correct endorsement, and we already have a sub shortage, so we may be starting classes without a teacher in front of these students. So I have directed my staff to focus on hiring and retaining, recruiting and finding educators of color 
to be in the classroom in front of our students on the first day of school. That is our first priority. I have not prioritized this report and the resources going into this report. It's one bureaucracy talking to another bureaucracy and the timelines just don't match up. Seeing no further questions, let's go to a vote. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Geary? Aye. Director Mack? Aye. Director Patu? Aye. Uh, uh, Director Pinkham? Aye. Director Burke? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. C1, adoption resolution number 2018-19-17 to declare that the lives of black students matter as well as the lives of all of our underserved students and that we encourage participation district-wide in the national Black Lives Matter at School Week from February 4 through 8, 2019. This came before the Executive Committee January 17th for consideration and consideration only because we had not fleshed out all the language and had not had an opportunity yet to collaborate. And you'll see that there is also an amendment. Motion, please. The motion, we move that the board approve resolution number 2018-19-17, a resolution of the Board of Directors of Seattle School District number one, King County, Seattle, Washington, to declare that the lives of black students matter as well as the lives of our underserved students and that we encourage participation district-wide in the Black Lives Matter at School Week from February 4th through 8th, 2019, as attached to this board action report. Immediate adoption is in the best interest of the district. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Obviously. <laughs> I would appreciate it if you would make the amendment, please. So okay, then we can back I it move out. that resolution number 2018-19-17 be amended such that the third paragraph of the resolution reads as follows. Whereas, as a public school district, we are facilitators of the limitless, limitless growth potential of human beings of all abilities with the charge to guide our youth in finding and achieving their purpose with a belief that every human being deserves to live with dignity and to pursue, pursue their dreams. That is the amendment that I'll make and I'll discuss the background when we're in general. And I'll second that amendment, thank you. Okay, it is time for questions, comments, and thoughts on this extraordinarily important resolution. Director DeWolf, as the maker of the motion, would you like to go first? To just affirm Jill's amendment. <coughs> I, I want to, <laughs> oh. I think we're all awake now. Yeah, but I, th I think um, we should probably open it up for general and we can okay. discuss them both at the same time. It's more elegant that way and I don't want to get caught in a bureaucratic mess here. I, I don't necessarily need to go first, but I do look forward to reading the whole resolution into the record at that point, so I would love to do that. Have at it. As amended. As amended. Okay, I'll read it. Should, Should we, we vote on that really quick? It's a proposed okay. resolution that's been amended. Okay. We haven't voted on it. Seattle School District number one, board resolution. Resolution number 2018-19-17. A resolution of the board of directors of Seattle School District number one, King County, Seattle, Washington, to declare that the lives of black students matter as well as the lives of all of our underserved students and that we encourage particip participation district-wide in the National Black Lives Matter at School Week from February 4th through 8th, 2019, although I think you could, I know we're adjusting that because of snow days. Whereas shouting loudly that the Black Lives Matter that Black Lives Matter does not negate our commitment to all of our students, but rather elevating Black students' struggle to trust that our society values them, we must affirm that their lives specifically matter. And whereas, 
As a public school district, we are facilitators of the limitless growth potential of human beings of all abilities, with a charge to guide our youth in finding and achieving their purpose with the belief that every human being deserves to live with dignity and to pursue their dreams. And whereas the killing of unarmed black men and women, including queer and trans persons of color, has left young people searching for answers to incredibly complicated and infuriating questions, and whereas throughout our nation's history, institutional and structural racism and injustice have led to deepening racial disparities across all sectors of society and have lasting negative of consequences for our communities, cities, and nation, and whereas historically, when black people have fought for a more democratic society, the lives of all people have improved, and conversely, each time barriers to black people's potential have been erected, our whole society has suffered. And whereas school board policy number 0030, ensuring educational and racial equity, begins by stating that the school board is committed to and the success of every student in each of our schools, and, quote, we believe that the responsibility for student success, if broadly shared by district staff, administrators, instructors, communities, and families. And whereas Seattle Public Schools recognize the, the importance of identity safety and has implemented programs to foster a culture of safety and affirmation of our students in color in ethnic studies curriculum, mentorship partnerships, my brother's keeper, the since time memorial curriculum, the African American Male Advisory Committee, implicit bias work through the partnership committee with the Seattle Education Association, Principals Association of Seattle Public Schools and Seattle Public Schools, training around trauma-informed practices, school-based racial equity teams, and a board goal to eliminate racial, excuse me, opportunity gaps. And whereas the problems of society are mirrored in schools and these problems can only be fully addressed with the united effort of community and school coming together for the betterment of our students' future, and whereas while the arc of justice is long and we will experience pain and setbacks, the pursuit of racial justice in public education is core to becoming a more free, equal, and democratic society, and whereas educators nationwide, including Seattle Public Schools educators, are organizing a week of action and education to promote the message that black lives matter at school. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Seattle School Board declares that the lives of our black students matter as well as the lives of all of our underserved students, and therefore, be it further resolved that the School Board encourages participation district-wide in the Black Lives Matter at School Week from February 4 through 8, 2019, through discussions in classrooms and in homes. Thank you. Director Mack. I have chills and appreciate hearing the whole thing. Um, I wonder if we might want to uh, amend the actual dates since we had a snow day and we're actually shifting the dates of Black Lives Matter, as I understand it. We don't have no, but I mean that the, my understanding was that the communication that came out was that the days started today and then goes through next Tuesday. Tuesday. So I wonder if we just want to amend that. So that's a Scrivener's correction. Is that correct, General Counsel, or should we? Amend the amended. Is that? Okay, thank you. Uh, Chief Legal Counsel Noel Treat, that's probably not a Scrivener's error at this point since it's actually a, a change in date based, based on scheduling. So if you have a particular week, whether it's next week in mind, probably better to do an amendment. Robert's Rules lets you have two amendments to a motion on the table at a time, so you could either go ahead and propose the second amendment or you could vote on the first amendment and then come back to this one. I'm not sure that it's substantively critical that the dates are important because I think particularly because the snow days were just shifting and that messaging is kind of known throughout the district. So I hear the kind of commitment to the actual dates. It's in the spirit of this is the actual Black Lives Matter School Week, which has been happening across the country. We just happen to have snow days, unlike pretty much every other district that's doing it across the country. I don't see anyone rushing for a second on that, so we're gonna keep talking. Okay, unless you, did you wanna second that one? Director Geary, I'm, no, people wave at me, cause I'm moving. Okay, Director Geary, please. Comments, questions, concerns, and thoughts, reflections. I just wanted to highlight um, my amendment, and I'm gonna read the background, because I think it's important, um, and it dovetails very nicely with what we heard on the strategic, um, around the strategic plan and the comments. Um, and so the background reads, Seattle Public Schools black students are disproportionately identified for more intensive special education services, particularly for intellectual disabilities. Our black students with disabilities are dis 
disproportionately disciplined, as well as demonstrate unacceptable gaps in achievement. These are symptoms of unacceptable educational practices. Unless Seattle Public Schools fully recognizes and properly addresses the varying abilities of its students and how issues of ability intersect with race, it will be unable to eliminate the opportunity gap and provide the high quality education our students deserve. So by changing, by including the word, the language around um, human beings of all abilities, I hope to highlight not, not label students as being special ed or having a disability, but more highlighting the fact that all students of varying abilities need to be included at every level of this conversation if we're going to be successful. Um, and we heard that from our families around the um, strategic planning, that they need to see themselves in the words somehow because we are so inclined to eliminate the topic of special ed or students with disabilities when we're talking about the gaps, when we're talking about the metrics. And I've heard from my co-directors how if you are not mentioned, you are invisible and that's not appropriate. So I wanted to take this opportunity to bring a little bit of language into this that makes this group visible within the conversation. And I thank you for elevating that, truly. Other questions, comments, concerns? Well, I've got a sentence that we wrote on the background of the bar that I'm particularly um, enamored with, and I'm also enamored with the ability of this board of directors to work together fairly nimbly and, um, and with a deep sense of purpose and, and frankly, um, a joy in what we get to do because it really is an honor. The degradation of respect, ignorance of these patterns, which references racism and white supremacy, it refers back. And societal hatred, including our country's president, suggesting that they are, quote, very fine people on both sides. When faced with violence and white supremacy, starts from the top and must be recognized and reversed, starting with the recognition of our children's future in a climate of respect and safety. What is happening in this country breaks my heart and it affects every one of our futures and if you haven't voted, please get involved. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Otherwise, we're moving to the roll call on the amendment. Roll call on the amendment, please. Director Pinkham? Aye. Director Burke? Aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Gary? Aye. Director Mack? Aye. Director Patu? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Roll call on the motion as amended, please. Director Patu? Aye. D Director Pinkham? Aye. Director Burke? Proudly, aye. Director DeWolf? Aye. Director Gary? Aye. Director Mack? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. This motion has passed unanimously. Thank you very much. And thank you folks for being down here to witness that. And thank you for all the people that have been elevating this and are teaching this. And I encourage you to bring your parents and your communities into your classroom so they can, um, some of them, take their fear quotient down. And we are on break until 7.45. Thank you.